Owen Jones esteve em Lisboa a convite do Bloco para discutir o Brexit e alternativas da esquerda para a Europa. Segue-se a sua entrevista feita pela Mariana Mortágua. Uh, first two questions we cannot avoid. Trump was elected the president of the United States a few days ago. Uh, and the first questions are first why do you think Trump won the elections even when most people were saying this was not possible to happen? Mm -hmm. And second, what can we expect from his mandate as the president of the US? Okay, so I think the reasons he was elected are multiple. I don't think you can take racism out of it. And the reason for that is uh, Trump won a majority of all whites, uh, the, except for uh, women with university degrees. So he had a big majority amongst white male college graduates as well as non-graduates. Uh, he had a majority of uh, affluent, rich white Americans uh, uh, as well. And actually a majority of people under who earn less than £30,000 voted for Hillary Clinton. However, I'll come on to the class element because that is still critical, it's absolutely critical and central. The other point, misogyny. I mean, Hillary Clinton was a, an establishment candidate, uh, but she was treated differently than male establishment candidates because Donald Trump's campaign was dripping with hatred of women. He bragged about, obviously, sexually assaulting women, those recordings, but all the way through the, an absolute hatred and disgust towards women. And there's a certain type of man who not only have they seen their skilled jobs disappear, which gave them a sense of pride, but for some, there's a backlash against the women's movement and the LGBT movement, which they think have damaged their own uh, status. However, there's no question whatsoever that there's anti-establishment sentiment sweeping the entire Western world, which is going in two different directions. One is a politics based on hope, a politics based on holding the powerful to account, a politics based on uh, building a society running in the interest of the majority. That's what the Bernie Sanders campaign was all about. Uh, that's what Podemos, uh, Syriza, despite the defeats it suffered, uh, your own parties, the left here in Portugal as well. Um, and then there's a politics of fear, which is blaming immigrants and Muslims uh, and people at the bottom of society for all the problems caused by people at, at the top. And in the United States, you've seen the stagnation or decline of wages for a generation or more, the destruction of traditional industries, um, and all this happened under successive Democratic and Republican uh, administrations, all of which have pursued policies that have often been very beneficial to those at the top of society, but not everybody else. So even though, because the Republicans always win a majority of richer Americans, that always happens, and the Democrats overall always win a majority of people under $30,000 uh, a year, for example, but the biggest single shift to Donald Trump was amongst those people under $30,000. There was a 16-point swing. So even if he didn't win a majority there, there was a dramatic shift in support there. And that, I think, is partly explained because some of those people voted for the first African-American president in the history of the United States four yeah, years ago. My question, how got, got, got Exactly, explain. and now, and now they voted for a candidate endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan. So it's quite a shift. And I think amongst those people, it's a sense of rage and anger at the so-called establishment. Hillary Clinton, yes, there was misogyny there, but she's the ultimate insider. She's seen as tied to a Clintonism, if you like, of the 1990s, which pursued policies, including free trade deals, which were devastating for places like Michigan and Ohio, and traditional kind of the Rust Belt places. Uh, she's somebody who is very close to corporate America, to Wall Street, uh, which in the aftermath of the financial crash is not very popular for good reason. She's close to foreign dictatorships like Saudi Arabia, for example, which partly fund her, so her, her foundation. So the whole thing altogether, you know, at a time of anti-establishment sentiment, having a candidate who is so easily portrayed as an establishment candidate was obviously not going to work. But the other point was, and I think this is absolutely critical, is Donald Trump won less votes than Mitt Romney four years ago. What's happened is a collapse in support for the Democrats as well. So she won millions of votes less than Barack Obama in 2012 and 2008. So one of the big problems was people did not feel enthusiastic 
to come out and vote. So even though, you know, we've got a calamity, and it is a calamity, of Donald Trump being elected, but it was, he won far less, sorry, he won significantly less than, uh, well, far less than Obama did a few years ago, but he won less than other Republican candidates in the last two uh, elections. And I'm afraid that was because, and the warning signs were there, you know, the most successful socialist in American history, in America, was in 2016, it's Bernie Sanders. Normally he would have got 1%. Well, did he win the election? I mean, I think the it, was so there's an odds. It's difficult because, you know, I studied history, so I, I'm, I've, I was taught, you know, of, to avoid counterfactuals. And it, it's certainly true his polling was a lot better than Hillary Clinton's. And, and it showed he would have defeated Donald Trump uh, in an election with a far bigger margin. Some would say, well, look, you know, the you know right-wing Republican machine hadn't even got started on him. In an election, things would have been differently, so I don't know. But we know that Hillary Clinton, people warned that she was going to be seen as the establishment candidate, and the fear was she would lose to Trump. We saw the lack of enthusiasm amongst Democratic voters. Some amongst African Americans, she did very well. That's why Bernie Sanders failed to win over African Americans. That's why he didn't win the nomination. But there's a massive lack of enthusiasm in the Democratic base. So she struggled against somebody. He normally would have got 1%, but because people wanted something different, they wanted an alternative, and they saw her as the old order. And that should have been the obvious sign in the Democratic primaries. And look what's happened. People didn't come out to vote because they saw her as more of the same, part of the establishment. They weren't enthused. In terms of what this means in terms of Donald Trump, I, uh, we should be very, very frightened indeed. And because this is not a normal Republican administration at all, this is, you know, I think fascism gets bandied around, but there are proto-fascist elements, which is of a demagogic figure uh, with a, uh, a personality cult and the movement based around it, which, uh, which is very authoritarian, which treats dissent as treason to the nation. Um, and people said, that he would, you know, he was campaigning for the Republican nomination. So as soon as he got the nomination, he'd change his thought type of campaigning. It was all just bluster to rally the Republican core base in order to win. But he didn't change his style at all. He carried on campaigning in exactly the same way. So, you know, people said, you know, I, I don't want to overstate my case, but with Mussolini in the 1920s, the old Italian order said he will be moderated by power. We will, you know. That's we, the question. What do you think would be the relation between Trump and the big financial corporations, the big banks? The, the well, he's already talking about uh, legislation to, uh, for example, uh, you know, legislation introduced limited re le re uh, legislation in the aftermath of the financial crash, for example, with a firewall between mm -hmm. investment and and savings. So he's already going to introduce. There's rumours he's going to introduce. Uh, he's, someone from Goldman Sachs is going to be in the administration. Uh, and this is the thing about right-wing populism. It, it, this is a plutocrat, a plutocratic American, a billionaire who campaigned as the man of the people against the elites. But he's defining the elites as anyone of a liberal in the American sense uh, disposition. Uh, whilst, you know, obviously we know the real elites are the banks, the corporate American, all the rest of it. So the, the danger is now, this is somebody with an extremely authoritarian perspective who doesn't accept democratic norms, uh, who has a Republican uh, party, which is terrified of him, even if they disagree with him, uh, and he has the Senate, the House of Representatives, and can now tilt the Supreme Court in a conservative direction. There are very little checks and balances on him. People were talking a few months ago about Trump and all the complacency as the end of the Republican Party. The Republican Party had committed suicide as a political force. We now have a situation where a demagogic, misogynistic, racist, uh, bigot, unhinged uh, bigot at that, is now the most powerful man on earth and has very few checks and balances on him. And I think what will happen is there will be confrontations as dissent builds against him, we've already seen the demonstrations, and he will use that as a pretext to start introducing overtly authoritarian legislation and to transform the very nature of the Republic as the United States was constituted. And in terms of what it means for the rest of the world, Every single bigot, racist, fascist woke up the day after his election and felt vindicated and triumphalist. They think history is now on their side. Right-wing populism is already sweeping across Europe. In Hungary, we have a regime which is increasingly authoritarian. 
with a opposition which is neo-fascist, uh, the Jobbik party. In Poland, the left has disappeared from parliament and politics is basically between liberal so-called conservatives and hard right uh, populist conservatives who are in power. All over Europe now, but that's, that's actually the same my, my next question. I mean, you can jump a few steps and and ask you what do you think, especially in Europe, what's the role for the for the radical left wing in this landscape when you have either liberal right wing supporting the, the the existing institutions or the extreme right questioning these institutions? What can the left wing do? Uh, what where should it be? What do you mean? In what sense, where should the left be? In what? In what? In what, what do you mean exactly? What, what, what is the strategy the, the left wing should have? Left strategy, uh, in your opinion. Uh, um, well, it's, it's hard because it differs obviously in place by place. I think one of the issues is, which has to be addressed, is the new form of right wing populism is very happy talking about class, and they're trying to redefine what class identity is, and that is of a patriotic working class whose lives and identity are being undermined by immigration and multiculturalism and that their real enemies are either liberals or the left. They're the real elite. And these are middle class elitists who live in the capital, wherever it might be, London or whatever, and they hate these people. They hate you. They hate your lifestyle. They hate your values. And they're trying to destroy your way of life with foreigners. They care about foreigners more than they care about you. And that's why, you know, the issue of class is very important. In, in Britain, we have a Conservative Prime Minister, for the first time in I don't even know how long, talks about the working class. And this is her whole approach. It's the, she said, if you're a citizen of the world, then you're a citizen of nowhere. And these people, they hate, they don't understand, they have contempt for your patriotism, they think your views on immigration are parochial, they're the real enemy. And what the left has to do is refocus in terms of it has to above all else focus on on having deep roots within the working class and that means communicating in a way which which resonates with working class people uh, the danger is at the moment i think is of a left often which speaks in a way that resonates with very small groups of people who are already politicized but for many working class people appears completely and utterly alien. And the danger is because the left coalition has changed. You've got more and more young people who've gone to university. So you've got the growth of young university educated people in big cities, and then older working class people in smaller towns. And in many European countries, they have completely different outlooks and priorities. So that's why you would see the traditional left coalitions are breaking down, they're fragmenting. And there's often a lot of hostility towards the two. In Britain, you've seen that young educated people, uh, university educated people in big cities, generally quite like immigration, they voted to remain in the European Union, older working class people in smaller towns don't like immigration at all and they see it as a big threat and they don't like the European Union because they think it means letting in foreigners. So the issue is how do you build that, how do you rebuild that coalition because that generational divide partly is an issue and I think that means, you know, the danger is of, of values and priorities of the left being overly set by, by those people in the, in the big cities without understanding at least how you communicate in a way that resonates with people but where I grew up. Let me ask you directly, uh, uh, after the, the Black Mail on Greece, uh, I think you, 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 I don't know, kind of defended or supported the idea of, of uh, exiting the European Union and then at the time of the referendum you supported the Remain. What made you change your mind and what do you think the left should do now that Britain voted in favour well, of... Well, the... I'm, I'm a left-wing Eurosceptic, so I'm, that means I'm opposed to the European Union in its current form because I think it's... Uh, it lacks democracy, it's rigged in favour often in terms of its treaties in favour of multinational corporations. Uh, so I've always made the argument that we need to build movements across Europe to change the nature of the European Union. The argument I made last July wasn't to support Lexit, a, a word I coined, which I'll never forgive myself for, because that became, that was then known as the, the left-wing support for Brexit, it's called Lexit, everyone now uses that term on the left to describe that phenomenon. But 
my view is that the left should debate and consider it. I didn't commit to it. I said we needed to have a debate. And the reasons I gave, for example, in the aftermath of, of Greece and, and so on and so forth. But above all else, the whole point of it, the discussion on the left at the time, and that was the beginning of Jamie Corbyn's campaign for Labour leader and all the rest, and was that David Cameron was going to negotiate away uh, workers' rights as part of any deal. So the, the, the basic rights guaranteed as part of the EU membership, like rights for agency workers, for example. And his view was the left and the trade unions would support whatever deal he came up with, that we were in the bag. So it didn't matter what he negotiated. So the argument that we made at the time was to say, no, actually, our support, we won't just support whatever deal you come up with. If you get rid of things like workers' rights, then we won't support any deal. And that was the position. Because of that pressure from the left, from the trade unions, he retreated on that. I mean, it's all now abstract because we left the European Union. The point was, yes, there is a case to argue for leaving the European Union. In Britain, we didn't have a referendum on the European Union. We had a referendum on immigration. That's what it was about. It was about nothing else. And it was the most toxic, poisonous campaign in post-war Britain. It was about uh, foreigners being terrorists, criminals, rapists. They drew up lists of the official campaign of EU migrants who'd raped and murdered people in Britain, as if to make the case that... These are the sorts of comments you normally see below comment lines on newspaper articles yeah. by people frothing at the mouth. That was the official campaign. They lied and said, Turkey is going to join the European Union and we will be flooded with Turkish criminals. They said they had Nigel Farage and he stood in front of a poster and it said, breaking point. And behind those words, in big block capitals, were dark-skinned refugees. Okay, but okay, we understand the situation of, of populism and the, way the, refer the, context, the political context of the referendum. Uh, but can the left wing be in a position uh, that you have to defend the European Union, or, we, or defending we, the European Union is the only way to 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 go against the, the extreme right? I mean, we're not saying that. No, 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 no. What, what we is the strategy right now? We, we, well, we had a campaign called "Another Europe Is Possible," backed by people like Yanis Varoufakis and so on. Look, you know, people often. I made the, you know talk about Greece, for example. You know about look. You know, people said to me, "Oh, and this is a betrayal of the people of Greece." The vast majority of people in Greece support staying members of the European Union. We know that. They support keeping the euro, for that matter, which I don't support, obviously, in any shape or form. And a majority of Greeks, according to opinion polls, supported Britain staying in the European Union. So that just wasn't... You know, if people said, I was betraying Greece by making that case, it just wasn't... You know, that's not, they're going against what Greek people think. In the case of Spain, you know, what for me made a big impression on me was the rise of Podemos. Because it showed that if we get new movements of the left across Europe, and if we get them into power, then we could change the European Union. That point Pablo Iglesias made to me in an interview, because I said, you'll just be treated the same way as Greece. And the point he made was right, which is Greece is a tight 2% of the Eurozone economy. Spain, on the other hand, is a huge economy. They simply, they would destroy the European Union if they tried doing the same thing to, to Spain. It would cause an, an existential crisis and collapse. So my view was that we build up movements and parties across Europe to do that my fear is at a time of the rise of the populist right if the European Union collapses which is perfectly possible in the coming years it will be on the terms of the populist xenophobic right and it will mean walking right back directly to the 1930s and could even mean conflict breaking out in Europe because the people at the moment all over Europe on the ascendancy are the populist xenophobic right And I just think, you know, they, the people who celebrated Brexit all over Europe it was Marine Le Pen, it was the Golden Dawn, all those people celebrated. Because they, and they were right to celebrate. Because, you know, when we left, and everything that's happened in the aftermath of the referendum, the surge in hate crimes, people being abused in the streets, because bigots now think they have a mandate. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, now dissent is take, to, you know, treated as treason. The, the government took uh, the government were taken to court to say that Article 50, the triggering of Article 50, uh, needed parliamentary scrutiny. So it didn't mean overturning the referendum. We're going to leave the European Union. That's absolutely going to happen. But they lost their case in court, so that means there has to be parliamentary scrutiny. The front page of the Daily Mail, the second biggest paper in Britain, was the pictures of the judges and the headline "Enemies of the People." But bear in mind during the referendum campaign. A Labour MP, Joe Cox, was killed 
by an alleged murderer, given it's in court. And do you know what he said when he murdered her, allegedly, although he said his name in court? When he was asked his name in court, he said the same thing. He said, death to traitors, freedom for Britain. We now have newspapers, right-wing newspapers, because Rupert Murdoch and all the rest campaigned for Brexit, using language of traitors, of, th of uh, you know, as though people who supported Remain are the enemy within. It is entirely a right-wing, populist, anti-immigration sentiment, which has now become completely mainstream, which is transforming political culture in Britain, and is very dangerous, because those extremists that are, are being emboldened, and the future of my country is, is very, very bleak at the moment. And so, uh, you know, the biggest disaster that before the British left since 1931 was Brexit. All it was was Britain leaving on the terms of the hardcore xenophobic populist right who are now triumphant. And, you know, you know and, and, and the people who are, who are going to suffer most, by the way, are, you know, migrants and so on who live, including people... If you're Portuguese and you live in Britain, I would feel pretty scared. Well, you would do. Yeah, I understand. I mean, we, we all have the, the idea of, of how strong is the, this change in the mainstream uh, politics and, and, and the growing of the extreme right-wing, well, not in Portugal, but in other countries of Europe. But my question is, when, when the left-wing uh, proposes an alternative and that alternative goes against mm -hmm. some of the major pillars of the of the European institutions, such as the fiscal treaty, well, we know uh, the way the institutions work and so on. And for example, if you are Spain, you might have some space of maneuver because of the size of the country and mm -hmm. the power your country has. But what would be your advice or your idea of a strategy for a government of a small country, such as Greece or Portugal or other small countries in, in European Union? Uh, that need a left-wing strategy, meanwhile? I, I think, uh, I mean, it, it, if we get, I mean, it, 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 it's an expression, surely, of total pessimism if we don't think the left can come to power in a major country in the European Union. I mean, we might as well give up if we think that. I think, it, I think that can happen. Yeah, the problem is, meanwhile, you, you have other left-wing uh, uh, governments. Well, uh -huh. Greece, I think, was the, the best example. In the end, what I think I'm asking you is, what do you think the Greek government should have done? Well, I think the Greek uh, the Greek government should have left the euro, not not the European Union. But they couldn't do that because the vast majority of Greeks were completely opposed to leaving the euro. So I don't know what they could have done. It's very easy for me to say, and you know, living in London, you know, hundreds of miles away from Greece. And I can write, as I did, columns in my flat saying, well, what the Greek, what the Greek government needs to do is leave the euro. I'm not governing a country where about 75 to 80% of people passionately support staying in the euro. Now, I, I, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to come up with the answer yeah, for sure, that. I mean, because in, 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 in Greece, there's the Greek Communist Party, and they support, on the, from a left-wing perspective, leaving the euro. Yeah, and, and they the were European. relevant in the elections. I mean, that's the thing. So what do you do in that situation? Because there is a left force which is making that case. But they're peripheral, they're not getting any popular support. And you look, I find it tragic, I look at Greek society, it's been ravaged by austerity and cuts, poverty doubled. And still is. Over half of young people out of work, which is devastating for the rest of their lives, scarring they call it. They're uh, more likely to be unemployed for the rest, uh, to, you know, to suffer unemployment, more likely to have lower wages for the rest of their lives. Mentally, it's damaging to young people to be out of work. I, I, but, but what do I, you know, what do you say in that situation? We can tell them what we think they should do, but that's not what the Greek people think, and the case is being presented to them, and they keep rejecting it. So my view is, in terms of Greece, is given, you know, that situation, what we need is, if we got in a major country like Spain, which is the most obvious example, and you can see the potential, there's now an unstable right-wing government, the uh, Podemos now in the polls of the second biggest party, the... The socialists have, have imploded as a political force. If we got a left-wing government elected in Spain, then I think that would be, you know, potentially they could confront the European Union in its current form, and the EU would have to back down on various issues. But, I mean, what, what is, in your opinion, the strategy that Podemos has to keep in order to go to the government and in terms of the alliance? To form a government? Yeah. 
Blimey. Um, I think, look, we have to recognise that Podemos were only founded about two and a half years ago. And I think sometimes, you know, our expectations have been so increased uh, because they exploded in size, got millions of votes. We thought in June they had a chance of forming a government before the election results came in, which was, you know, it was a terrible weekend that, if you're on the left, uh, maybe you disagree that we had Brexit, the implosion within the Labour Party in Britain, uh, which fell into internal crisis, and then Podemos did much worse than, than was expected. But they have done, they've made a huge leap forward. They now look like they will supplant Bersori as a political force. And I think the space in the coming two years, as disillusionment grows with a weak right-wing government um, and its policies, for Podemos to assume, you know, uh, to, to win over a lot more support than they've already than they've already won. And I think, yet yeah, they do need to work out, you know, what amongst their problems are, they've got the support of lots of younger Spaniards, but they're struggling with older Spaniards. So they need to have a strategy. If I look at in Britain, the problems we face, one of them is increasingly we're losing the support of older people. So I think Podemos, you know, they've got a very youthful leadership, which is an advantage in lots of ways, but they need to have a strategy to win over some of those older people who either vote for Pessoa or the or for the PP. Uh, so I think that's absolutely critical and how they do that. Uh, but you know, and I think they have to show as well that they've gone from you know, they're not they're not just activists; they're rulers. What's helped is the mayors of change across, obviously, like Ada Calau, Manuel Carmina, and other mayors across Spain. So that shows they can govern. Uh, but I think they need to prove that's the reality. Lots of people who voted for them as a protest against the system mm-hmm. sure. didn't see themselves then as I don't, you know, I'm, I'm voting to protest. I'm not voting because I want them in power. So they need to prove that they're c- capable of running uh, of running Spain, and they haven't managed to do that quite yet. So I think, I mean, those are two problems that I can see facing Podemos. But as I've said, it's easy for me to critical. I think, you know, anyone on the left who criticises Podemos, they're the most successful radical party in the whole of Europe. And they've come out of nowhere. So, you know, I think we've all got to learn from them because the United Left, who I've got a lot of respect for, they're now in obviously co Unidos Podemos. But, you know, they they were getting the same kind of support in the opinion polls since the fall of Franco. Mm -hmm. Podemos only come along and they get a level of support the United Left have never got. So I do think that shows we do need to learn from something like Podemos. It's not yet been enough, but they're so new and fresh. And I think now as they prove in the next two years, they are an alternative government, they reach out to more older people, then I think I think they'll be you know in a much better position to form a government. But as I've said, I just think at the moment, the disintegration of the European Union will be of benefit above all above anything else. I know in Portugal you don't have a mass xenophobic populist right wing party, but those forces on the ascendancy all over Europe, they're the ones most desperate to dismantle the European Union. Because, you know, the left lots of left parties like Podemos, Syriza, I know they've been defeated in terms of being in government, but they support the European Union. The people are most determined to dismantle it are Marine Le Pen and the National Front. Yeah but uh, we have to we have to finish, but don't you think well, the biggest responsible for dismantling the European Union, and in Portugal we don't. Well, the European Union it's important in uh, in countries that are not in the euro area, but for us it's the euro that counts. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. more than the European Union yeah, because you have a set of institutions. The euro is a disaster. I agree. Is it? So the question is, don't you think that the, the responsible people for destroying the European Union and the eurozone are the ones actually dictating the rules. I agree. Oh, I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, the people who are responsible for the crisis of the European Union are the people who've imposed austerity, which has been disastrous to the people of this continent, including here in Portugal, who've promoted privatisation, attacks on workers' rights, uh, who've suppressed the living standards of hundreds of millions of people, increased poverty, increased insecurity, they're the ones who are completely responsible. I absolutely accept that. And part of the symptoms of that are the rise of the far right, like the National Front. So do you think there's a connection between the rise of the far right and austerity? Absolutely, of course. The National Front in France, attracting working class, and this is what should alarm us, not just working class people, young people are being attracted to the National Front in France. The sorts of people who should be supporting the left and the National Front have been ingenious because what they've done is they've combined anti-immigration and anti-Muslim hatred mm-hmm. with stealing the rhetoric of of the left on the economy. 
and it's a it's a very very clever thing to do because the reality is where lots of people are is they are angry with big business and because of our failures in lots of your in lots of European countries they're angry at immigrants as well so if you claim you're against both then that's quite a, quite a successful electoral formula as it turns out but it's very very dangerous indeed fascists the far right are always capable when it comes to the economy of you know they'll swap rhetoric and they'll flip between left and right uh, uh, you know depending on, on on the circumstances but but the truth is the people who are responsible are the rulers of the European Union particularly the German government because their policies have led to you know their economic policies have not just destroyed people's lives promoted mass poverty and unemployment they've also led the foundation for far-right parties who threaten the very existence of the European Union now I don't think the answer to that is to dismantle the European Union because that would be to benefit as things stand those parties they're the ones who are going to benefit from that but it does mean getting left-wing governments elected which can confront the European Union and get rid of things like support for privatization austerity and all the rest which at the moment are in, in the fabric of the European Union of course they are so you don't believe there's a left way out or a left-wing way Alexia. out? Alexia um Alexia um as things stand, I think, even though, look, in Portugal it would be different from our context because you wouldn't have a referendum about immigration, you wouldn't be, you know, if you had France, if France exited the European Union, the reason they'd exit the European Union, above all else, would be because of immigration and blaming immigrants for the problems that France has. And that would be a disaster. There would be a right way, a right wing way out. Well, exactly. Well, but in I France, it would it's possible to have a democratic uh, way out of the European Union and the European institutions in the case you don't find a collective uh, solution. In, in Portugal, problem. in theory, you could see how a left exit could take place. I accept that. But in the current context, whatever Portugal's exit terms happen to be, or whoever has ag agitated for it or whatever, the people, as things stand, would be most jubilant about it would be the far right across Europe because they would say, fine, there's another example of the whole thing collapsing and that would boost support within their own countries on their terms because that's what it would be in the Netherlands and in, in, in France, uh, in Italy for that matter. And I think as things stand, it's up to the people, it's not for me to dictate to the people of Portugal. The people of Portugal need to determine their own future. No, They're, I'm questioning in general. I'm not even uh, defending my opinion, I'm just asking. I mean, whether you like it or not, isn't that the, the result anyway? Isn't that, I mean, the result would be the right wing uh, taking advantage of mm. people's distrust in yeah. relation to European Union and, and the left wing just watching it while well, it look, happens it's and... True, of course they'll always and of course they'll always try and do that but that's still the objective political circumstances we have where the ascendant forces across the western world particularly after Donald Trump are the populist xenophobic right they're the ones now at the moment history is on their side and Hungary you know in Hungary if they leave that will be again to on the basis of right wing populism and I, I think for myself it's up to the people of Portugal if Portugal end up leaving the European Union that is the fault of the European Union and nobody else because they pursued policies which devastated the lives of millions of Portuguese people. Uh, they attacked the, you know, policies that attacked the welfare state, workers' rights, uh, which benefited the richest people in society. They will be responsible uh, and nobody else. Uh, and I perfectly understand and sympathise. As I said, I'm a left wing Euro skeptic. I'm very sceptical of the European Union um, in its current form. But the aftermath of Brexit for me in Britain has been a, ch it's been a chastening and a terrifying experience because how quickly things can shift. Because it is, it is an orgy of reaction in a way I can't describe, where immigrants and people of colour are terrified and feel scared. I spoke to a Romanian woman who said she's scared to leave her own house, uh, where people on the left are treated, or well, not just the left, anyone vaguely liberal, judges who are just abiding by the rule of law are called traitors and the enemies of the people where you've already had one member of parliament killed by someone yelling death to traitors feeding for britain the atmosphere is terrible and it's toxic and i would say i understand the reasons for for leaving the european union but i can't help but look at the echoes of the 1930s at the moment i know how that film ends it doesn't end very well and the disintegration of europe as a political entity in its current in the current political context i worry would just be a a huge boost to the far right but it is up to the people of Portugal and I can understand why people would leave and any final, the, any final comment you want to, to leave to them? well just finally I mean because it was all a bit Portugal. it was all a bit depressing I think what I'd say is you know 
Portugal is actually a bit of a life raft. It's a beacon of hope because, you know, you don't have a, you know, the sort of more radical left-wing government that I would like. But you do we have... would like it as well. Well, indeed, and maybe <laughs> you'll deliver it one day. But you do have one of the only countries where you, you don't have a right-wing government. And you've shown that there is at least the potential for an alternative. And we can't solve the problems we face. Britain's going to leave the European Union, but it doesn't matter. We have to build solidarity across Europe, whether you're in the European Union or not. We can't overcome the problems we have one country at a time. The injustices that we face. Now, uh, that means building solidarity. It means, it means you know, having, you know, working as closely together because the people we're up against, they don't respect borders. And Even we, though they say they do. Well, indeed, of course, that's their populism. But what, what I mean is they, they are you know, globally united and they're a formidable force. And we can't beat them one country at a time. We can only do it if we build solidarity um, across borders. That's not going to be easy. It's going to be very, very hard. But, you know, just finally on that, you know, Portugal has a proud, inspiring history of people who fought fascism, who fought dictatorship, who fought for democracy. And all over Europe, you have that story. You have people who stood up against injustice, who stood up uh, against tyranny, who stood up for the rights of women, who, for the rights of workers, the rights of LGBT people. And the way we get change isn't by waiting for the generosity of the powerful, it's by people from below fighting for their rights and their freedoms. And we stand on the shoulders of giants. Everything we have was won by our ancestors who fought at great cost. So let's have the same determination, courage and resilience people showed in Portugal in 1974. Uh, let's you know, build a different Europe, however we get there. Um, and I believe we will. And despite how frightening things are with the rise of proto-fascism, the world's last superpower now in the hands of an unhinged racist psychopath, uh, <laughs> there is hope because there are movements like Bernie Sanders, like Podemos, like you, who are determined to change the world and build a world running the interest of the majority. And we will get there, even if it looks hard at the moment, we will achieve it. It's a good way to go. Thank you.